begin our service. According to the clock, it's five o'clock. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter two. I'm going to continue on my Easter stuff, as I told you last last Wednesday night. My reasoning, everything, everything we are and everything we ever will be hinges on the resurrection. There's not. Uh, I don't believe we can preach too much on the resurrection. Philippians chapter two, verse five. I'll just show you. Later on in Paul's life, here's what he's still saying. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. He said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Okay, that, yeah, that's a good statement. Sounds good. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashions as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jeremy was a normal child. He had a terminal illness which affected both his, uh, his mind and his body. So he wasn't normal, I, I guess we'd have to say. But still his parents had tried to give him just as normal a life as they could and, and had, had sent him to a Christian elementary school. At the age of 12, Jeremy was only about second grade level, and it just seemed like he wasn't able to get past that and the ability to learn. And he was a frustration to his teacher and, and to all the children in the class. Just, he just couldn't seem to get past that second grade level. Well, springtime came, and the children talked excitedly about the coming of Easter. They you know how kids are about, about holidays. And their teacher stood up and told them the story of Jesus. And then she began to emphasize this idea of new life springing forth. And she gave each one of the kids a, a large plastic egg with, with an assignment. She said, I want you to take this home, bring it back tomorrow with something inside that shows new life. I remember he, she said, I want you to to show me something about new life. Do you understand? Kids, you know, they understood. And, and so they all, you know, said, hey, we'll do it. It's great. They recited all, all of them except Jeremy, little boy with problems. He just listened real carefully. His eyes never left the teacher's face. And had he understood what she had said about Jesus' death and resurrection, did he understand the assignment the teacher thought that maybe she ought to call his parents and, and tell them you know, whole, what the deal is, what to expect, but she forgot to do it. Well, the next morning, 19 kids came back to school laughing, talking. They placed their eggs in a, in a large wicker basket and, uh, and on Miss Miller's desk. And after they completed their math lesson, they, it's time to open up the eggs and see what the, what's in the eggs. So the first egg, she... She found a flower inside this egg. And she said, oh, yes, a flower is certainly a sign of new life. And, and when plants begin to peek through the ground, we know that spring is here. So everybody was excited. Uh, then a little girl on the first row, she waved her arms and said, this is my egg, Miss Miller. And she, she called out. And the next egg contained a plastic butterfly, which looked real. Teacher held it up, and she said, we all know that the caterpillar changes into a, a beautiful butterfly, and yeah, that's new life, too. It's all about new life. And boy, this little girl, her name was Judy. She smiled proudly and said, Miss Miller, that, that, that one's mine. Next, the teacher found a rock with moss on it. She explained that moss, too, showed life. Billy spoke up from the back of the classroom and said, my daddy helped me. Pretty obvious that'd be something a man would do, wouldn't it? But 
But then the teacher opened the fourth egg, but the egg was empty. Surely this must be Jeremy, she thought, and obviously he didn't understand her instructions. Uh, if only she had gotten a hold of his parents ahead of time because she didn't want to embarrass him. And she quietly set the egg aside and reached for another. But Jeremy, he wasn't having it. All of a sudden, Jeremy, he spoke up and he said, Miss Miller, aren't you going to talk about my egg? Well, teacher really didn't know what to do. She just flustered and she said, but Jeremy, your egg is empty. He looked at her, looked her in the eyes and said softly, yes, but Jesus' tomb was empty too. From the mouth of children, we hear things about the resurrection. The, the symbol of new life is found in the empty tomb. Notice in Matthew 28, it says, But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, whom was crucified. He's not here. He's risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell the disciples that he's risen from the dead. So much about the resurrection. Uh, Romans 1 says, But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, I mean, it's everywhere. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Peter talked about it. Paul talked about it. John talked about it. Uh, uh, who raised Jesus from the, from the dead shall give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. I mean, bringing the indwelling of the Holy Spirit even back to the resurrection. Wouldn't have been possible without the resurrection. There's recently an article that's published that, that revealed the secrets of hidden surprises in computer software and video games. Programmers add these surprises to give the programs an, kind of an added appeal. Some of the examples were funny, like the hidden message, I'm being held a prisoner in a software factory. Others were meant to entertain, like a, a hidden computer pinball game, the Microsoft Word 97 program, and hidden virtual pictures of the mountain peaks. You've seen them, blue skies in micro, uh, Microsoft Excel 97. I remember that one we had it on our computers here. But do you know that these little hidden software surprises are called? Anybody that's not in the computer field want to know what they're called? They're called Easter eggs. Easter eggs. It's great to open one, one of these programs, and find a surprise. But that's what they were called from the manufacturer. Imagination is a wonderful thing. Out of it, we get, and I want you to hear me closely, and I know, but once again, you can say, well, preacher, you're doing this late. No, I know what I'm doing. I'm talking about the resurrection. Amen. We, but, but out of imagination, we get a fairy that pays money for teeth. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. Now, how many of y'all have done that? Yeah. Paid money for teeth. You know, I see some kids, I understand, that getting $5 now for a tooth. You know, it's, uh, uh, they're, they're making, I mean, if I'd got $5 for my teeth, I'd have pulled them all. You know, but you see a fairy that, that pays money for teeth. Imagine, I mean, who come up with that? Uh, an old fat guy that delivers gifts. I mean, what in the world? A rabbit that lays eggs. But it's all empty celebration. Has any of your rabbits ever laid eggs? <laughs> Yet you, I'm glad the people back home, the people listening can't hear John up here. <clears throat> you don't need a bunny or some eggs to excite the imag imagination about Easter, though. It stands alone without any help. Our empty celebration, that's what I want to talk to you probably the next week or two, is our empty celebration is found in the empty tomb. Yeah. You say, wait a minute, that, that's a, an oxymoron. No, no, it's, it's not. Our empty celebration is found in the empty tomb. 
Now, there's three empty promises that we can celebrate, not only on Easter, but we can celebrate all year long. Three empty Easter promises. The first one I want to talk about, probably maybe as far as I get tonight, is an empty life. In verse, in verse 7, Jesus showed that the way to be full is to be empty. The way to be full is to be empty. Tell that to my gas tank, someone said, but that's what Jesus said. I mean, if you'll notice in verse 7 of the text we read, uh, you, you can go back to the, to the book of Philippians, and he says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. See, real fulfillment comes when we're empty of our own desires and make Jesus our heart's desire. When we become empty of our desires, our own personal desires, and make Jesus our heart's desire, what do you mean by that? So much of our lives are spent with what we want out of life. So much of our lives are spent, I want this, I want that. Uh, the, the term bucket list has been, you know, made a popular term by a movie that, okay, here's what I want to accomplish. Okay, I'm 65 and what do I want? What is on my bucket list? All having to do most of the time with things we want to do. I want to go to this place. I want to climb Mount Everest. I, 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 I want to, you, you know, uh, uh, to take a train ride in Europe, I mean, whatever that the someone comes up with. But what's on your bucket list that has to do with Jesus? I mean, he says, he made himself of no reputation. He who had it all was the crown prince of heaven. He had everything at his disposal, but he came down to earth. All this is found in Philippians 2, our text. I mean, this, I mean, it tells the whole gospel story here in just a few verses that Jesus left it all and came down and emptied himself of no reputation and humbled himself on the cross. Jesus, what is our... I, mean, I, I think a lot about this more than I used to. Real fulfillment comes when we're empty of our own desires and make Jesus our heart's desire. That's what Paul's talking about. See, Jesus' last words before his death, it's finished. Remember that? It's finished. Now, what does that mean? It means fulfillment. That everything that needed to be done was done. Amen. That's what it means. That Jesus, here's another slant on this, that Jesus literally emptied himself of everything he had to offer to me and to you. That we might live and have life more abundantly. He emptied so we could be full. He emptied himself so that we could have life and life abundant. He poured it all out that it might be found within us. Now, when you watch him live, you know that his life was consumed for humanity, for you and for me. And he emptied himself of all other cares. He's concerned about people. He stepped into humanity at its worst, and he offered his very best. Emptied himself of all life to fill ours with his. If you're not experiencing God's presence in your life, it may be that you're not empty enough. And I believe that may be many of our problems. Is if, if we're having trouble experiencing God's presence, God's fullness, Abundant life, as, as we could go back to our lesson on living in Canaan and, 
and which was complete, you know, being what God would have us to be. It may be that we're not empty enough. We serve a God that specializes in filling emptiness. You realize that? He specializes in filling emptiness. Are we empty enough? In creation, he flung the universe into an expanse of emptiness. He hung the stars on nothing. He turned nothing into something, then hung it on nothing. In John chapter 6, we see a group of people with empty stomachs, 5,000 plus. Some say as many as 20,000 on that hillside. There was four plans that were offered, and, and, and I see us in that. That's another message, but, but, but I see us in, in John chapter 6. you got a situation here. Jesus has been preaching. The people have followed him out a long ways, and, and, and there were four plans offered. And Jesus said, these people need to eat. What are we going to do? And he turned around. And by the way, do you think Jesus needed advice? He knew what he's going to do. But the disciples said, Let's just get rid of the problem. Tell them to go away. Jesus said, that that's not it. They'll faint on the way home. Yeah. Remember? He said, they'll faint because they're running on empty. Yeah. Been out there all day listening to Jesus. Yeah. Philip said, let's raise the money. He did some figuring, found that it would take 200 days wages to buy enough bread that just proves to you that money's not the solution to every problem. Yeah. It can't buy everything. Amen. Money can buy a house, but it can't buy a home. Amen. Money can buy a bed, but it can't buy a good night's sleep. Yeah. Money can buy medicine, but it can't buy health. Right? Amen. Money can buy a beautiful church building, but it can't, it can't buy the power of God to work in that church building. Well, Andrew found a little boy. Here's the third plan. Andrew found a little boy with a small lunch and said, it's not much, but it's a start. Yeah. But Jesus had the true solution as he took the little boy's lunch and demonstrated that little is much when God is in it. God got in the lunch and, and it turned into a miracle. But in all four Gospels, Jesus, this is important. All four Gospels, Jesus gave thanks prior to even breaking the bread, showing the multitudes that only God can fill their emptiness. All four of the Gospels tell us that. Only God can fill their emptiness. We serve a God that specializes in filling emptiness. You remember in John chapter 2, back up four chapters, he fills some empty wash pots. They were at a wedding feast, a, a village event that the marriage supper of Canaan that the whole city came out for in those days. Everybody came out to wedding. There was a festival, a party mood uh, until the unthinkable happened. The host ran out of wine. Man, that's a big deal. By the way, this word in the Greek means unfermented. I, I, I think that I can prove that to you, but to, if you'll listen, we went through you know, that a few months ago about, the, about all the drinking and stuff. But the people began to scurry about and, and whispering about the problem and, until the whole crowd knew and the host was embarrassed. Read it. That's what it is. The host was embarrassed because we ran out of wine. Well, the Lord let them scramble for a little while before he brought the solution. He allowed them to feel their emptiness. He allowed them to see their inadequacy. He waited until they ran out of options. Wow, that sounds like us, don't it? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We try everything that we can try before we go to Jesus. Why in the world are we like that? Amen. Why in the world, we, we'll try everything and, 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 then, and then finally, 
we'll say, well, hey, let, let's, let's try prayer. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that the way we are? Yeah. Now, you, you, we're all ready to pray for somebody else, but hey, what about when it falls in your, something happens in your life? I'm going to do everything I can, and then I'll call Jesus. But anyway, Jesus was just letting them see what's going to happen, and he waited until they ran out of options. Neighbors don't have any. I mean, there's no I mean, there's nothing else we can do. And then he took empty water pots, filled them with water, and then worked the miracle and turned the water into wine. And the joy that the world has to offer is just temporary. It always runs out. And the, the result is always a void left over. It's always emptiness. But the joy of the Lord, according to the book of Jeremiah, is new and ever satisfying. Jeremiah says God's mercies are new every morning. Aren't you glad for that? The world offers you it's best at first. Now, I believe that's what's taught here in this. And once again, I don't have time to teach this lesson in the middle of this lesson. But the world offers you its best at first until you get hooked. And then it's all downhill from there. I believe we can see that in this passage too, but that's another day. The best day you'll ever spend in sin will be the first day. Mark it down. The best day you'll ever spend in sin will be the first day. Hebrews 11 talks about the pleasures of sin. What does he say about them? How long are they? For a season. For a season. You, the, it said Moses enjoyed the pleasure of sin for a little while. Proverbs 14, 13 says, Even in laughter the heart is sorrowful, and the end of that mirth is heaviness. Proverbs 20, verse 17 says, Bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth shall be filled with gravel. <laughs> kind of an odd way to put that, but I think we all get the point. But Jesus gives a miraculous joy that never ends. He gives us his best from the start. And somehow, miraculously, makes the joy grow and get even better. I, I mean, truly, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. The, the old song, the longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. I, listen, I understand those songs better than I used to. Amen. I promise you I do. Amen. Because he really is sweeter than he was. You say, well, you remember when you got saved and you're always talking about getting saved? I remember getting saved. I remember, but I, but I want to say this too. I know him better now than I knew him then. He's sweeter to me now than even then because over these 47 years, I've learned to get to know him. Learned to know his character and his love and his mercy and his grace. I, I know more about grace now than I knew 47 years ago. I know more about mercy than I did 47 years ago. I know more about second chances, third chances, fourth chances than I did 47 years ago because I've got to know him. But what I want to say to you tonight, that Jesus took water pots that were used in those days for external washing, and he made them useful for something internal. Something deeper and more satisfying. He, he created something fulfilling and he used emptiness to do it. We serve a God that specializes in filling emptiness. Let me ask you tonight, Sunday night, class, are you running on empty? If you're not experiencing intimacy with Christ on a daily basis, a daily basis. Well, I've been to church twice today on a daily. But I come Wednesday night on a daily basis. It may be that though you feel empty, you're not empty enough. Yeah. Does that make any sense? You say no. I believe one of the biggest problems we have among us 
is we're not empty enough. We need to make room for Jesus by taking some irons out of the fire and making him a priority. Brother Doug said it pretty ably this morning that, you know what, when you're laying flat on your back, all of a sudden what you thought was important, not nearly as important, is it? When, when, you're, when you're gasping for another breath, all of a sudden your portfolio is not the most important thing anymore and the, 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 you know, the stock market's not on your mind very much. and uh, the, the, you know, Those things really don't matter. We need to make room for Jesus, but we need to get more empty. Take some irons out of the fire and make him a priority. Well, we also need to be emptied of sin. God can't fill a vessel that has no room to pour into. That's the best statement of the night. I started to illustrate that, but, but we're all smart enough to get that without me illustrating. If you got a, if you got a cup here, if it's full... There ain't no room to pour nothing into. Well, the the same thing, it's impossible if we harbor sin in our lives, if if we're full of sin. Now, I understand Christians aren't sinless, but we should sin less. We're not sinless, but we should sin less. It's all about desire. True repentance is not perfection, but true repentance is turning from sin and doing our best to head toward God. And you've heard me say it a thousand times. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about, is coming and saying, God, I know I've messed up. I'm sorry. Help me to do better. That's what it's all about. And he's talking to the church there. We need to be emptied of sin. We also need to be emptied, hear me, we need to be emptied of self. Folks, we will never find intimacy with Christ until we stop bowing down to the shrine of self. We need to be emptied of substitutes. You say, what what do you mean by that? Let me illustrate. Be careful because often we try to substitute service for surrender. Now let that sink in for a minute. We try to substitute work for worship. And there's a big difference. Well, I mowed the yard, I mowed the church yard. I, I, I come up and worked on the building, I did this, I did this, I did this. But you know, and I made this statement to my, uh, how would I say this? It's a very embarrassing thing to say, but as I've, to- I've said it before in the pulpit, I'd rather knock a hundred doors in a hundred degree heat than just be still and know that I'm God for an hour. You say, preacher, that's not a good thing for a preacher to say. Oh, I guess it depends what circle you're in. Because some are in almost a work salvation mode. But I'm I'm saying that's where the problem is. That many of us would rather work. And I'm talking about work hard. Than to worship. You know why? Because for some, it's easier to do that. Than to worship. I, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, you say, I was actually listening to what Doug said this morning. But you, you remember he said he had his hand up? Why was that so hard for him? Because yeah. yeah. in Bible college, especially in Baptist Bible colleges, we were taught that lifting up holy hands, that wrath and doubting was basically saying we got, showing we got clean hands. You know, and that. I know, I know that argument. And so we, we took that, and, and that runs along with the cessationist doctrine, the last apostle died and sold all the miracles, and Jesus don't do what he used to do anymore, that 
I, I'm not willing to buy into that, but I had it pounded in my head for five years at, at seminary. But, but, but understand this. Martha becomes Mary when she drops her to-do list and just falls at the feet of Jesus. Amen. You know the story. Martha's cumbered about, she, we got some Marthas here in this church. Yeah. I can call you names. We got some Marthas here. I mean, you need something done, they'll do it. And do it well and do it right. We got a bunch of them. In fact, we got more than usual in this church. Martha's. Making sure it's done. Jesus here at supper. And he's going to have the best. I mean, and the very best because he deserves the very best. And she was right in that aspect of it. But yet Mary, all she did was sit at his feet and listen to every word that he said. And, and then finally Martha says, hey, look at her. I'm doing all the work. And all she's doing is sitting in here. And, and, and Jesus, and you know what? Instead of saying, you know what, Mary, she's right. Jesus said, no, uh, Martha, Mary's getting it. She's getting it. She's understanding what this whole deal is all about. She said, and he said, don't be encumbered about with all this busyness. We'll eat later. She understood that Jesus was going to die. She understood that I, I, I need the the most important place is to be sitting at Jesus' feet. I, I, and another thing, talking about uh, it's easier to to work than worship. But when when Charity was was in the coma, she had been in a coma for eight weeks. No hope of survival. Brain waves are straight. I've spent every nickel I've had. I put my house uh, equity on the line. I, I mean, we were totally, I've told you about that time in our life where we literally didn't have nothing, just wanting to keep her alive. Insurance wouldn't cover isolation, ICU. Little claws in the fine print. But when God finally did, once we were totally empty, and I mean totally empty. We were tired. We were broke. We were empty. Jesus shows up and pushes everybody else aside, and he touches her. He performed a miracle on her little life. Amen. And when he'd done that, all of a sudden, here's what we see from her. A little eight-year-old that had never seen it in a free will Baptist church. Yeah. Laying in a bed. By the way, it was like this because her left hand still had paralysis. It was like this. Just praising the Lord. Amen. I don't understand all what went on. She didn't want to be back here. But what I am saying to you, some Marthas need to become Marys because we're substituting work for worship. We're trying to substitute service for surrender. Serving is good and it's right, but don't let yourself get so busy doing things for Christ that you neglect spending time with Christ. Amen. Oh, please, you ought to write that somewhere. I mean, it, don't let yourself get so busy doing things for Christ that you neglect spending time with Christ. Accept yeah. no substitutions for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Don't fill yourself up with drugs. Don't fill yourself up with food. With, don't fill yourself up with movies and music and even relationships, nothing less than Christ. Amen. That's what our text is telling us. Yeah. Empty yourself out on this altar. 
Do you know what this altar is? This altar is a toxic waste dump. That's what this altar is. Empty the sin, the self, and the substitutes. We have the promise of an empty life. Jesus is our example, and, and we should follow these footsteps. Also, number, number two, we see an empty cross. An empty cross. I've never appreciated the crucifix hanging on a mirror or a hospital wall because Jesus isn't there anymore. I don't have any in my home because Jesus isn't there anymore. The cross is empty, and yet the cross is full of God's promises. The empty cross tells me that I can be forgiven of all of my sins. The cross was a cruel place of death. Jesus was beaten and broken and bruised. He took it all upon himself that we might not have to. Aren't you glad for that tonight? In verse 6, Jesus showed that the way to go up is down. Open your Bibles there to our text. He says, the way to go up is to go down. The old song says, when I couldn't go to where he was, he came to me. He came down to my level when I couldn't get up to his. The empty cross tells me that I can be free from my past and that I can have a great life through Christ. It's the place where he died, but today that cross is empty. Empty of Jesus' body, but full of God's promises. Full of hope for you and for me. And the promise of the empty cross is that you and I stand forgiven because it was on the cross that Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. And you, everybody in this room knows that. But I want to take just a couple of minutes to remind us about an empty cross. Amen. And then number three, the empty tomb. Yeah. Verse 8 and 9. Jesus showed that the way to live is to die. In our culture, all these are oxymorons. But in Christ's economy, they're truth. The way to live is to die. Without the empty tomb, there's no Savior. Without the empty tomb, there's no salvation. There, without the empty tomb, there's no hope. And in fact, th there's nothing for sure without the empty tomb. The song says, tomb, you shall hold him no longer. Death is strong, but life is stronger. Stronger than the dark, the light. Stronger than the wrong, the right. Faith and hope triumphant say, Christ will rise on Easter day. While the, patient lie, er, while the patient earth lies waiting till the morning shall be breaking, shuddering beneath the burden dread of our master cold and dead. Hark, she hears the angels say, Christ will rise on Easter day. When the sunrise smites the mountains, pouring light from heavenly fountains, till the earth blooms out to greet once again the blessed feet. And her countless voices say, Christ has risen on Easter day. For in the fact of the empty tomb is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the promise to every one of us that we too are going to be raised to eternal life. To everybody that knows Jesus as their Lord and their Savior, aren't you glad what Paul said to the Corinthians? He says, death has lost its sting. It's no longer something to be feared. I was talking, as I told you this morning, I was talking to, uh, it was Larry. This I talked to Dennis for a long time. I just had a uh, knee replacement. Then talking to Larry, which has had a couple of heart attacks. Uh, he's in uh, kidney failure. He's needing a kidney transplant. And they put the ports in, you know, they're going to have to start doing the dialysis more often. And, and just 
you know, he's got a myriad of, of physical problems, and he's a relatively young guy, but you know, he's only 66. But what we begin to talk about that, just I'm driving down the road, and I guess he's in his office or somewhere, but I said, Larry, I said, I, I've been at, at that point uh, about three times. Because he asked the question, he said, Curtis, he said, Do, we really believe what we preach, don't we? He said, you and me both done a bunch of funerals, hadn't we? I said, yeah, we have. He said, we've stood out in the, in the cemetery and we, we've, uh, well, we can quote them, 1 Corinthians 15. He said, yeah, I can, Larry. I can quote most of the chapter. He said, Curtis, it really is true what we preach, isn't it? Now, I don't know whether he was questioning himself or questioning me or just double assuring, which I think it was. I said, Larry, I've been there about three times. I mean, I'm going to listen to me very close. If you're listening, uh, Larry wasn't doubting his salvation. He wasn't, that, that, ain't what I'm, that ain't what I'm saying. Larry is very sure of his salvation. But I said, I've been at that place about three times in my life where I thought this is it. This is it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to die. Three times that's happened. And I said, Larry, all three of those times, listen, I, I didn't want to leave my grandkids, didn't want to leave Karen alone, didn't want to leave the family, didn't want to leave the church, didn't, didn't, didn't want to, you know, still had some things I want to do and some places I want to see and and just and all those things racing through my mind in a split second. But I said, Larry, one thing that in all three of those times, here's one thing I can say for sure. I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid if this was it. I wasn't afraid. That's the greatest testimony I can give. Because it's coming. You hear me? Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. The old must die, the young shall die. It's coming to all of us. Amen. There's some of the young here that will die before some of the old. Car wreck, some unforeseen disease pop up. It happens on a daily basis. But the question I ask you as I close tonight is, are you afraid? Jesus' resurrection made it where you don't have to be afraid. Jesus was, in, was in, putting it on Brother Paul's heart as he was addressing. I told you the Corinth church, what the whole deal was all about last Wednesday night. But uh, uh, the, see, the, the fact that this empty tomb is the truth of the resurrection of Jesus. The promise that we're going to be raised to eternal life. We discussed that Wednesday night also. But we do not have to fear because death has had its stinger pulled out. Yeah. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Don't have to fear it because the sting of death is what? Sin. And I've been forgiven of my sin. What fear is there when we have the promise that one day we're going to live with him forever in heaven. And really death is not the end. Death is just the beginning. So what have I got to fear? The world gives us promises full of emptiness. God gives us emptiness. Please hear me. The world gives us promises full of emptiness. God gives us emptiness full of promise. I challenge you tonight. We need to get empty so we can be filled. Silly rabbit. Eggs aren't for kids. It's an empty tomb. Full of promises for all who would be God's children. Amen. Oh, 
talking to you tonight about emptiness. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. A lot of things you taught us in the scriptures, Lord. Way up is down. You got to be empty to be full. You got to die to live. <laughs> so many things that the finite mind really can't understand, but God, we that are yours, the Holy Spirit speaks to us and shows us exactly, exactly what it means. Thank you, Lord, that we see an empty tomb, an empty life, an empty cross. Speak to those here tonight in this room. This little room could actually be impactful to this whole region. Help some of the Marthas to transition into Mary's. Does that mean we don't do the work? Oh, no, you never said that. But God, to empty ourselves, to make sure that we've got room for you. Oh, God, help us be empty so we can be made full. Help us to die so we can live. God, we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.